Thank you. Okay, good morning. Uh, so I'd like to tell you today about how we're fighting spam with Haskell at Facebook. So let me start with the problem. So the problem is there are some bad people on the internet. And the bad people on the internet want to do things like post spam and show it to you. And they want to do things like send you to websites that will infect your computer with malware and then steal your credentials and post to Facebook on your behalf and do all sorts of bad things that give you a bad experience. So obviously, we'd like to stop this as, as far as possible. And the spammers have some sort of big weapons available to them. So they can use scripting. They can use botnets. And they've got lots and lots of resources. So we'd like to be able to stop this automatically and build systems that we can uh, remove all the spam in an automated way as far as possible. Obviously, we'd like to squash attacks quickly, because the more, the more quickly we squash an attack, the, the fewer people will see the spam, the fewer people get a, uh, their computer infected with malware and so on. And also safely, of course. So let's think about how we can do this. So here's a simple picture of, of Facebook. We've got a user on the left. The user is posting some content to Facebook. Here's the Facebook front end. When they post their content, the content goes to Facebook. And then it gets written to some storage, and then it's available for other users to see. So if we want to stop spam, we're going to need some kind of system that will distinguish bad content, malicious content, from the good content. So we'll build a system. We'll include it in the back end of Facebook. So when the front end gets the content, we can send the content to a system that distinguishes malicious content from good content. And if it says yes, then the content doesn't get written to the storage. Instead, we just send a message back to the user saying they can't post this content. So that's exactly what we do. We have a system called Sigma at Facebook that does exactly this. And it lives here in the, in the back end. So what is Sigma? Sigma is basically a classification system. So for every action taken by a user on Facebook, where an action is something like posting content, sending a message, click a like button, sending a friend request, that sort of thing. Sigma classifies all of these actions as to whether they're malicious or not. So it ends up classifying something like tens of billions of actions per day. That includes all of the actions on Facebook and, and Instagram too. So Sigma is basically a rule engine. That means for each of these actions, Sigma will evaluate a set of rules where each of the rules is designed to to identify a set of characteristics about that particular action type or that particular attack and hopefully detect that attack. So for a new attack, we'll write a new rule. And for each action type, we have a different set of rules that, that identify characteristics particular to that action type. So although I've said bool here, in fact, a rule can do more than just return yes or no. It can block or take other action. It can do things like if we detect the user has had their credentials compromised, we can log them out and help them change their password. If we detect that their computer is infected, then we can help them clean it up. Um, and over time, we can collect lots and lots of data about what constitutes good content and bad content. And we can feed all that data into, into uh, a machine learning pipeline. And we can build a model of what's spam. So our, our rule database ends up being a, a, a mixture of sort of manual written rules and machine learned rules. So one important thing about the system is that rules have to be able to be updated live. So that if a new attack comes in, we can write a new rule, we can get it into production very quickly and start catching the spam. So this system has actually been in production for many years now at Facebook. Uh, and it's been highly effective at eliminating spam and malware and all other types of malicious activity. So then the question is, how do we define these rules? Well, I'll give you an example to make this concrete. So the example I'm going to invent a fictitious form of spamming. Let's imagine we've got some <coughs> functional programming fanatics, and they're, they're spamming their friends with posts about functional programming. So we have to identify this somehow. So let's make a rule that says, if a person's posting about functional programming, and they have more than 100 friends, which is suspicious, perhaps. And more than half their friends like C++. This is going to be our rule. Okay? Then we'll block it, else allow it. So let's think about where we get the information for each of these different conditions from. 
whether they're posting about functional programming, that's just part of the content they're trying to post. Whether they have more than 100 friends, we'll need to talk to the storage service. We'll need to uh, interrogate it about how many friends the current user has. And again, whether their friends like C++ or not, that's something that's stored in the, in the Facebook graph that we call it. So let's look at what the code for the rule looks like. We write our rules in Haskell. So we're going to write a rule called FP Spanner, and here's its type. Its type is Haxel bool. So Haxel bool is, is a computation as opposed to a simple bool. A Haxel bool computation can do things like it can fetch data from storage services. It can consult the input data, so the content of the, the post or whatever. It can throw exceptions, and it can eventually return a bool. So let's start with the first condition in our rule. So the first condition was whether the user is talking about functional programming. So FP spammer is defined as talking about FP, where F talking about FP is defined to be, well, it's whether the string contains functional programming applied to the post content. The post content is itself a computation that returns a text. And if you've not seen Haskell before, this is the operator that applies a pure function on the left to a computation on the right. OK, so that's fairly straightforward. What about the number of friends? So let's imagine that we've got an operation numFriends that returns an int, and it's a computation in the Haxel monad again. And so we can make our condition out of numFriends, and it's got to be greater than 100. Well, we can't use the ordinary greater than operator because that just operates on integers. So we have to make a lifted version of the greater than operator called dot greater than. And this operates on computations, Haxel A, Haxel A, uh, where A is something that can be ordered, and then it returns a bool. And to combine these two conditions together, talking about FP and numFriends, we need an AND operator. And again, we've got a special version of the AND operator called dot AND, which takes Haxel computations. So this is just a bit of convenience to give us some more concise syntax. And the final condition in our rule is whether the friends like C++ or not. So we're going to call it friends like C++ and define it down here. And it's defined as, well, first of all, we have to get the friends of the current user. And then we can, that gives us a list of friends here. And we can filter that list by a predicate. I've assumed we've got something called like C++ available. So this operation here filters that friend list by this predicate giving us a list of the friends that like C++. And then finally, we can do this calculation down here, which determines whether more than half the friends are like C++. OK, so that's basically our rule. So the observations here, the language for writing rules is just Haskell and libraries. So a fancy way of saying that is it's an embedded domain-specific language. But we were fairly keen that this language should be just standard Haskell. OK, we haven't changed the syntax or anything like that. We looked at various alternative designs that involved building another layer on top of Haskell. But actually, we thought it's really important that users can just go and buy a Haskell book, read that, and learn about how to use it. So there's no operational details here. And I'll come more onto, uh, on, onto what that means later. The semantics are pure. That means. So any sub-expression in our language always has the same meaning. Uh, there's no side effect. We're just doing reading. We're not doing writing of data at all. And that gives us scope for some automatic optimizations. It's all about efficiency. So we focus very much on just functionality so far. Uh, but efficiency is really important. So remember that the user is waiting for the answer of this because they can't post their content until they've got the answer about whether the content is, is bad or not. So we've got to think about fetching our remote data. Remote data can be slow to fetch. So let me make a quick claim here. So the claim is so first approximation that is that fetching data efficiently, efficiently is all that matters. And that breaks down in two ways. So the first way is. We want to fetch only the data we need to make a decision. And secondly, 
we need to fetch data concurrently as far as possible. So first of all, let's deal with number one. So going back to our example, we want a rule that says these three things. And remember, the first one was just information about the content. So that's going to be fairly fast, fast to fetch. And secondly, we need information about the friends. So that involves a remote data fetch. So that's fairly slow. And finally, the final condition here was information about each of the friends. So that's several different uh, queries or one large uh, multiple query. So that's likely to be very slow to fetch. <coughs> so really what we want to do here is to avoid the slow checks if the fast checks already determine the answer. So that's why we've done it in this order. So we do the fast check first, and if that's false, then we can avoid doing these slow checks. So I go back to the code, and we'll use this AND operator here to combine our conditions. So it's really important that the AND operator is shortcutting. That means if the left-hand side returns a false, we don't go ahead and evaluate the right-hand side. So that means the program is actually responsible for getting these in the right order. And we give the programmer some tools to help with that. So they can run their rule against some sample data. They can look at the results. They can look at what data was fetched. And they can decide to order the things in a, in a sensible way. So that's the first part of our efficient data fetching. What about the second part, concurrency? So you know if you've written any code that does any data fetching, it's really important to make sure that when you're fetching data that doesn't depend on each other, uh, it's really important to do that concurrently. And indeed, if you're fetching data from the same back end, from the same service, usually we can make a batched composite request or query and, and it, uh, execute that as a single query. So traditionally, we have to deal with this ourselves. We have to do concurrency in some way. We have to fork threads, or we have to make a batched query, or we have to do some asynchronous constructs or whatever. But it's hard to get that right. So nothing's going to tell you if you don't have enough concurrency. Your program still works. So what happens is we lose op opportunities for concurrency. And furthermore, the users don't really care about this. All they care about is the functionality. All they care about is making sure their rule does what it says it does. Uh, and eventually, it clutters the code. And then it becomes hard to refactor, because when you refactor the code, you added more dependencies, or you remove dependencies, and then the concurrency isn't quite as good as it, as it could be. So the advantage of our framework is that it just takes advantage of the data dependencies that exist. And as far as the data dependencies allow, we can do concurrent requests. So the programmer doesn't need to think about this. And going back to our example of friends like C++, so there are two parts to this. First of all, we were getting the list of friends, and then we were doing some condition on each of those friends. So this leads to a sort of data dependency uh, graph like this, where we're getting the friends, and then the data is used by each of these different uh, operations down here, which can all be performed concurrently. So another example that I often use to illustrate this is uh, the number of common friends of two users. So to compute the number of common friends of two users, we need the friend list for each of those two users and take the intersection of those two lists and then compute the length of that. So this is how you might write that. First of all, we've got uh, getting the friends of A, getting the friends of B, call that FA and FB respectively, and then take the intersection of FA and FB and finally, the length of that. And we can see because friends of A and friends of B don't depend on each other, our dependency graph looks like this. And we could actually do these two things together concurrently. And in fact, since they go to the same back end, we can batch those into a single query and make that a single request on the network. So how does this work? Well. So we have our code here that we wanted to write. Um, but the way to make this concurrent, at least using our framework, is that you have to use these applicative operators. So these two fragments of code actually mean the same thing. But this version is the one that will execute concurrently using our framework. So this is the version that we want to execute. But this version is more convenient. 
especially when things get larger, because you can just write a sequence of statements. You don't have to think about which things are independent of each other. So data dependencies in the first version, the fact that we're not using FA on the right-hand side of here means that we can transform this version into this version and have it execute concurrently. So that's exactly what we do. We implemented a transformation in the compiler called applicative do. And in our source files, we can just turn it on using this uh, language pragma here. And then we get automatic concurrency and batching as far as the data dependencies allow. So this turns out to be quite a general transformation uh, in that it's semantics preserving provided your, your monad um, satisfies some laws. And you can just apply this to any old Haskell code. And depending on the monad, it might have some benefits. Like in our monad, it gives you concurrency. It might improve performance in other situations. Uh, so we've actually pushed this upstream to GHC. It's going to be in uh, version 8.0.1. So maybe you wonder, does this work in practice? So we applied this transformation to our entire code base which is many thousands of lines of code. And our most common request that we execute on our service contains hundreds of fetches typically, and that executes in under 10 rounds. So what that means is there are 10 rounds where we're doing a complete concurrent batch data fetch. And in under 10 rounds, we can do all our hundreds of, of data fetches. So it works fairly well. And we found that concurrency is just not a first order concern when we're thinking about the code that we write. So when we're doing code reviews, when we're looking at problems that come up in production, the performance problems tend not to be about concurrency. They tend to be about fetching too much data. OK, so I said that to a first approximation, data fetching is, is what you need to focus on for, for performance. But actually, well, the second order concern is caching. So clearly, if you write something like, the number of friends of x in two places in your code base, you expect they give the same result. But if you don't do caching, then each one of these is going to make a separate request to the, to the database. And the second one might give you a different number of friends because the data might have changed between those two requests. Um, so for correctness and for, for perceived uh, consistency, it's quite important that we make sure these produce the same result. So that's one reason that we cache them, and also for, for performance. But we found that once, once we have caching, it's just a, a, a nice feature for modularity because it means you can just fetch data wherever you like without having to worry about plumbing the results of data from one place in the program to another. Uh, so it gives you a nice sort of freedom to fetch data wherever you like. And it means that we could do some automatic uh, optimizations, like we could take these two expressions here that are the same and common them up. And that's a slight improvement over uh, doing the caching because it means we wouldn't have to do a separate cache lookup the second time around. So another benefit of caching is what we call replayability. Because by the end of a request, the cache has built up a record of all of the data fetches that were performed. And that means the cache lets us rerun the entire request without fetching any more data. If we just rerun the request from the start because it's deterministic, it will fetch the same data, and the cache gives it the same results. So it does exactly the same thing. So that means if we save the cache, we automatically have a unit test that we can run later on, as long as we can you know, save the cache in some format that we can read back in again. It also means that if an error occurs in production, we can save the cache, and then the, the user can debug that error offline using the cached data, even though the actual data might have changed in the meantime. Uh, something else we can do is analyze performance with cache data. So it, it gives us lots of benefits. But caching by itself isn't really enough. So imagine we had another rule called any spammer, and this is reusing some of the conditions that we've made earlier on, like our FP spammer rule. So any spammer is defined as either FP spammer or some other spam type, and, and so forth. So this is fine. It's nice and clear and concise. But naively, we're just recomputing FP spammer. 
And that's sort of okay because we've got caching. And caching is going to avoid refetching everything that FB Spammer needs. But we still recompute the whole thing. You know, we still walk down through that computation, re execute all the data fetches. The data fetches will find the result in the cache. And that's a lot of work. So it might be expensive to recompute that. So the answer to this problem is to memoize things. And memoization is really just a sort of generalization of the idea of caching all the data fetches. We cache the results of computations as well as data fetches. And this, the sort of simple rule that we've been using is to memoize everything at the top level. So these things, FP, Spammer, some other spam type and so forth, they're all top level computations. We found that just memoizing all the top level computations uh, gets most of the benefit of memoization. And then there's also manual memoization available if you want to memoize things like functions that take arguments and so on. Okay, so that's, that's about the technology. I'd like to tell you a bit about the experience of, of actually building this, this system and running it in production. So the Haxel project, which we started over two years ago in April 2013, was to redesign and rebuild an existing system. The existing system we had had a DSL. It was somewhat functional, called FXL. And by this time, we'd accumulated hundreds of thousands of lines of, of FXL code. So the project was to rebuild this system using Haskell instead. And by July 2015, we deleted all the FXL code and replaced it with Haskell. And we'd also trained our engineers who are now using Haskell. So we have dozens of engineers, I think, uh, using Haskell day to day now. So the first problem is, what do we do about this existing source code that we've got in this internal language that nobody else uses? So we had to translate this code automatically into Haskell. It was not feasible to do it by hand. So we wrote an automatic translation tool that takes the FXL code, <coughs> translates it into Haskell code that we can then run. But we can't just do this once because n ensuring correctness for the entire code base would be too much to do in one go. So what we had to do is to retain the source code, the old source code, uh, for some time until we were sure that the Haskell code was going to perform correctly and give the same results. So this is sort of long, long scale, uh, long term migration. Uh, during that migration, we sort of redo this translation. Every time the FXL code changes, we regenerate the Haskell code. So how about correctness? How can we be sure that the, the Haskell code is running correctly? We've got hundreds of different request types for each of those actions, each of the actions like sending a message, clicking a like button, and so forth. Each one of these is a different request type in our system. And for each of these request types, we have to make sure that the Haskell version is giving the same results as the original FXL version. And also, we have to make sure it performs well enough, too. So we do this one by one so that we don't have to do all the work at once. And as each request type is ready, we want to switch it over to running the Haskell code in production. So this was fairly tedious work, as it turned out, because there are lots of dark corners in the semantics of the old language that don't quite match up with the equivalent operations in Haskell. So we built ourselves a motivational tool. We called this the, the whiskey clock. And the whiskey clock is filled with whiskey. And each time you manage to successfully migrate a context, a, a request type over to Haskell, you take 10 milliliters of whiskey. <laughs> well, you slow down the more you do, so it has a sort of damping effect. <laughs> So the, the kind of problems that we came across were things like this. So what, what's, uh, what's the result of rounding 0 0.5? Well, you, know, you, you make an arbitrary choice. And it turns out the arbitrary choice that we made in uh, the old language FXL was different from the choice made in Haskell. And this sort of thing crops up in production, but only very rarely. You have to run lots and lots of requests before this difference would show up. And we found lots of things like this. So there were things like, uh, differences in Unicode encoding, differences in regular expression semantics, lots of dark corners of libraries and, and, uh, uh, and language features. So after we've done all that, we're in the position where we can just run Haskell in production now. And we have to think about 
switching the source code from FXL over to Haskell. Before we can do that, we have to migrate the users. So we have to teach our users somehow how to write Haskell instead of writing FXL. So this was a fairly large effort. We had uh, multiple geographical locations with the users in. Uh, what we did was we wrote a lot of teaching material, sort of online teaching material they can go and read. And we also ran in-person, multi-day, hands-on workshops where we taught people Haskell from the sort of basics, but omitting a lot of the really abstract stuff because we wanted to just teach people enough so they could get their jobs done. We created an internal Facebook group called Haxel Therapy, and we found that uh, while we help, uh, our team helps the users, they also help each other, and we're sort of creating a culture of people helping each other, and that's working out quite nicely. We also do lots of code reviews. So this is part of sort of building up the culture of the uh, shared knowledge. Um, we start by doing code reviews, and then users do code reviews for, for each other and so on. So how do they cope with the switch? Well, they're still committing happily, so people are still getting their jobs done. We found they slowed down slightly. Um, there was a learning curve to climb, obviously. There were some sort of struggles that we hadn't anticipated to do with the difference between whether people should use do notation, the sort of simple sequence of statements form, versus some of the, uh, the nice combinators that Haskell gives you for shortening that syntax. And people wanted to use the short versions rather than the do notation. And we started out with a simple do notation because we thought it's just simpler to learn. So we sort of switched tack on that and started using some of the more, uh, the more elaborate combinators. And then we found that some users started embracing the new features. They started building abstractions, started using types, which weren't in the old language, incidentally, uh, creating tests and just making the code base nicer. And now we're at the, the position where some of the sort of large-scale rewrites and redesigns of subsystems are now unblocked by the move to Haskell. So um, one question is, does it work? So it works in theory, does it actually work in practice? There are questions like, is it going to be stable enough? Is it performance enough in production? Did we have to make any changes to the compiler? What about all the problems with build systems and you know, how do you integrate it with your existing systems and so on? And we have to support live updates, so we have to be able to change the code and get it running in production as fast as possible. How do we do all these things? So let's look at a sort of simple diagram of the system itself. Uh, so the Sigma binary, the old version over here, is mainly C++ and it had this sort of uh, interpreted FXL code in the middle. The new version with Haskell is, is still C++ at the top and the bottom because there's an awful lot of careful engineering that's gone into building a, a server, a network server, and we use Thrift for our servers because Thrift is a sort of language independent protocol that we can talk to PHP with. And we've got C++ at the bottom for the same reason. Lots of engineering has gone into building these clients for other services on the network. So we kept these two layers and put Haskell in the middle. And the Haskell in the middle itself has various layers. At the bottom, we've got a layer for talking to C++. So we had to do quite a lot of FFI, foreign function interface work, to make this layer work and, and work fast. Um, so the client code, the bit the users write, is right in here. So I'm afraid you can't see this graph very well. But we did find one bug in the garbage collector. It was a bug that had been there for many years. And this was causing our machines to crash every few hours under constant load. So when you just have one machine, you probably wouldn't notice when you have lots of machines like we do. Um, this was causing multiple machines. This is a graph of machines crashing. Uh, and it's sort of, there's lots of machines crashing over here and then it sort of stops when we rolled out the fix around here and then there's no machines crashing here. So I used to say this is the only runtime bug we found, but actually we found one more um, that fortunately wasn't affecting production. Uh, so it runs very stably. And in fact, we found that Haskell code just doesn't crash at all. And that's really nice. Uh, it, it's great to know that you know, the large chunk of the code that you're pushing into production just doesn't ever crash. And we can let people just write code 
push it out to production without worrying, at least from a stability perspective, whether they're going to break anything. Uh, which is good because, as I say, diagnosing a crash in Haskell is very hard indeed uh, because you don't have the, ba the benefits of stack traces and sort of uh, runtime monitoring. Uh, the asterisk, asterisk here is about FFI code. So the code that talks directly to C++ has less uh, safety guarantees than the rest of Haskell. So we have found the occasional bug in that code, and that does lead to crashes. But fortunately, our users don't get to write FFI code. We do, and we can hammer on it very hard and make sure there's no bugs there. So what about performance? So this is a graph of performance. The, uh, it's normalized to the old system, FXL. Uh, the yellow bars here are FXL. Uh, the blue bars are Haskell. This is for our 25 most common request types. And higher is better. So the best, uh, this is ordered by performance. So the best performing Haskell request performed about three times better than the equivalent FXL. And we had a few that didn't perform quite as well over on this side. So overall, we found we had 30% better throughput from the Haskell system than we had with the old system. And in fact, these measurements were done quite a long time ago, and we've made further improvements since then. One thing we did find uh, to do with performance is that good monitoring is really essential. So in our environment in production, um, there are lots of different changes happening all at the same time. So you have multiple sources of changes. You've got users pushing code into the system. And we've got dependencies on other services, which are also changing. We've got the overall load on Facebook itself, which sort of varies throughout the day. And because the system is designed to stop spam and malware attacks, these tend to be bursty. So we get a new attack coming in. Uh, it causes extra load on our systems. So every time we get a difference in performance, it can be quite hard to narrow down exactly what caused that difference. So having lots of monitoring, having lots of graphs covering different aspects of your system's performance is quite important. Um, one thing we did was that we hooked up the garbage collector to, to the monitoring infrastructure so we can see performance of the garbage collector along with all the other uh, performance aspects at the same time. So one thing that we did have to add to, uh, to the compiler and to the runtime is resource limits. So one thing that can go wrong is if you have a request that takes an inordinate amount of resources, it, it runs for much longer than the other requests, it uses up a lot of memory, this can cause a problem for that machine running that request. All the other requests on that machine start going slowly. So what we had to do was put an arbitrary limit on the amount of memory of a given request can, can use. Uh, and usually this happens by, uh, so the cause of this is, is something that didn't happen in testing. It's something that only happened when you started running things in production. Because your code was fine in testing, but actually when you ran it in production, we had some untypically large data. We had a user with tens of thousands of friends or something. Uh, or we had a regular expression engine that goes uh, exponential in some cases. These kind of things cause the problem. So. We added per thread allocation counters to the runtime. So the counter starts off at a value. It counts down every time the thread allocates some memory. And when the limit is enabled, if the counter gets down to zero, it throws an exception. So we use this to put a limit on the amount of memory that our request can allocate. So uh, we found that. This was really easy in Haskell. We tried to do a similar thing in C++, and it was in the old system. It was really hard because you had to pass around a custom allocator. You had to make sure that every time you're allocating memory, you're doing it with, with your custom allocator. And if it's deep in a library somewhere, that's really hard. So it's just turned out to work really nicely in Haskell. So here's a graph of one particular heavyweight request that we enabled about here, and we started seeing spikes in the live memory in our systems. And when we enabled the allocation limits here, we saw these spikes just go down to almost nothing. And during this period, this was adversely affecting performance. 
it's quite badly on some of our machines. Uh, so I mentioned garbage collection briefly. What about latency in garbage collection? So the Haskell runtime has a stop the world garbage collector, which means all the threads stop at once and they have to do garbage collection together. So surely that causes a problem for latency, right? We don't want this garbage collection to last too long, otherwise we're going to, to exceed the latency guarantees that we're trying to provide. So basically, we had to put a bound on the amount of work that the system can be doing at any one time. So we have a fixed number of worker threads, and together with allocation limits, that puts a bound on the amount of live data that can be in the system at any one time. So that puts a bound on the amount of work the garbage collector has to do. And we found that this is effective enough at reducing the latency of garbage collection and making sure that we can stay within our, our guarantees. The system itself is almost stateless, so it has very little persistent state. The only state it has are things to do with open connections to other services and so forth. Um, and to reduce the overall latency, we did do a handful of GC improvements. So we looked at the workload that our system was putting on the garbage collector. We looked for opportunities to improve things. We found some really low-hanging fruit. And we actually pushed some of those changes back up to, uh, to the compiler. So I think overall we improved the, uh, the overhead of garbage collection by about half for our workload. So what about hot swapping code? So I mentioned that we have to push code into production very quickly. And obviously the benefit of doing that is the faster we can put code into production, the more spam we can stop. Um, of course, we don't always need this. So many of the changes that we actually want to get in don't need to be pushed in you know, right now. So typically, we do code review. Um, but the sort of slogan is that the code in the repo is what's running in production, modulo a delay of a few minutes. So how can we deploy new code? Well, Haskell is a compiled language. So what we have is object code, have compiled object code. Uh, and that needs to be distributed to all the servers running the system. And then somehow, we've got to start running that code. Well, one way you might do this is by restarting the process. So that's how we often solve this problem. But restarting our process takes a long time. The process has lots of connections, open connections to other services, has sort of internal caches and so forth. So it takes you know, on the order of 30 seconds a minute to restart the process. So we could do a rolling restart of the whole fleet, but that would take a long time. It would take a long time from you know, starting to push it to your rolling restart finishing to get a change into production. So what we'd like to do somehow is just swap in the new code, so the new client code here. We'd like to swap it into our process in place of the old client code. So the main idea is just that we want to load the new code directly into the memory of the running process. So that needs a dynamic linker of some kind. And then once we've loaded in the new code, we can start running new requests on the new code. Meanwhile, the requests running on the old code will just expire. After a while, they'll finish. When all of the old requests are finished, we can just <coughs> unload the old code from the process, and we've completed the switchover. So you could do this using a, an ordinary dynamic linker, the system's dynamic linker. Um, but it turns out the GHC runtime has a built-in linker that we use for our interactive environment. So we just repurposed that built-in linker and started using it for loading in object code at runtime. We needed to enhance it somewhat, uh, so we had to add support for unloading objects uh, with GC integration. So when the old requests are finished, we have to know when that's happened at some point. So it's the garbage collector that knows when there's no live data in the heap that actually references the old code. So we added some integration to the garbage collector to detect whether an object is no longer needed and then call the linker to unload it. So one or two other things, just very briefly. Um, so build systems, we're using what's called stackage, uh, stackage LTS. This is a sort of curated collection of packages, so we don't have to worry too much about 
dependencies between packages, third party packages that we depend on. And we integrated that with uh, the Facebook build system. It's sort of internal build system that knows how to build C++. And we taught it about Haskell and how to, how to build uh, combinations of C++ and Haskell in the same binary. Uh, we had to use the FFI, I mentioned. Uh, so the FFI with C++ isn't as smooth as you might hope. It works very well with C, but C++ has mangled function names. So we ended up writing a tool to mangle C++ function names so we can use those directly from Haskell. And something that we learned very early on is to catch all our exceptions in C++, because if an exception leaks from C++ into Haskell, it kills the whole process. Um, and that tends to happen when an error occurs. So if this happens in production, it's because some service went down, then all of the machines do this at the same time, and they all die. So uh, it was pretty important to make sure we're catching all the exceptions in C++. Um, for our users, for, for sort of developing code using our DSL, we built a customized version of the, uh, the interactive environment that uses the Haxel monad rather than the IO monad as the default way of interacting with code. And then we built a, a se selection of commands they can use for doing common workflows. So that's the end. I'd be happy to take any questions. <laughs>